Hello and welcome to another episode of the CAD Dimensions 3D Printing Podcast. Uh, we try to do a podcast uh, every single month to talk about technology and 3D printing uh, because we are on a mission to inform and empower engineers all over the world with the best tools possible that then empower them to make a positive impact on the world around us. Uh, my name is Adam Fosnott. I'm the hardware technical team manager uh, here at CAD Dimensions. And joining me today uh, is Kevin and Ben. Uh, if you guys want to wave, uh, they're Hello, from everybody. our marketing department. Uh, and this uh, episode is extra special because we have uh, one of our first guests on uh, the 3D Printing Podcast, Corey Haas from Desktop Metal. Thanks, Corey. Um, no, no one told me I was one of the first guests. <laughs> set me up. <laughs> you know, we probably should have told you that beforehand, but no, uh, you you get to set the bar for any and all future guests. So no <laughs> pressure. I'm the guinea pig. I love it. That's great. <laughs> um, but our first segment is we are going to to get warmed up with a thought provoking question from uh, from Ben. I got a good one for you this month. So we're talking about metal 3D printers. It's in the news lately. By the way, congratulations on uh, on going public. Uh, that's really big. That's a big deal. And uh, so I have a metal 3D printing question for you. And if you had to choose one type of metal 3D printing process to use for the rest of your life, you couldn't go back. It's kind of like the pizza question, like what kind of pizza would you have to eat for the rest of your life? But instead of pizza, it's, I don't know, 3D printing. What would you do? What process? You have, I, I counted like four. So you have BMD, which is bounded metal disposition. And then you have SLM, EBM, and... LMD. And am I missing one? I think there's a fifth one, which Sounds is... Sounds like a the, lot of alphabets, too. <laughs> it is. And desktop metal shop, what process is that? Yeah, so, it's one of the few that's not like a three-letter acronym, right? Could you have one for it? Or I guess not, just binder jet. That's probably better. Um, but we we actually do. So we call it single pass jetting, just, just to, to fit in. <laughs> that's cool. I like that. So uh, what would you choose? If you had to choose one type of metal 3D printing process to use for the rest of your life, what would you do? Sure. Yeah. So, so first, you know, thanks for your congratulations. It's a really exciting time to be at Desktop Metal. It's been quite the journey, but uh, I think it's also just a, a really exciting time to be in the industry as a whole, right? I think it's transforming and uh, moving kind of at breakneck speed. So that's awesome. In terms of, of your question, right? And, and maybe it's, it's a little loaded, right? Because uh, I'm at Desktop Metal. But what, what I think is really interesting is when you look at the industry as a whole, as I said, I think it's going through a transformation right now, right? Historically, we always saw the, the tools and the equipment out there being leveraged and used in typically lower volume applications, right? It, it came from rapid prototyping, right? That's what it used to be called. And, and that's where it was used most successfully. And I think what we're currently seeing in the entire industry, right? Not just at desktop metal, but is this transformation where we're starting to grow beyond that, right? I, I think there's always going to be a use case for it. And I think it's always going to be leveraged within that segment of, of rapid prototyping. But I think we're seeing now um, with desktop metal and beyond is this transformation and growing beyond that scope. And what I mean by that is, is truly manufacturing with additive, right? Truly being an additive manufacturing source. And I think one of the technologies leading the charge um, in that front is binder jet, right? Specifically our, our shop and production systems and is really unlocking the potential for companies and industries to manufacture with additive, right? And I think the concept there and why it's going to be the one I pick um, is because it allows you to kind of go from the, the beginning, right? Go from that traditional rapid prototyping workflow and grow and transform into a, a true manufacturing environment. And what I think you guys, I'm sure have seen it, right? It used to happen all the time is someone would send you a 3D model and it would be designed and optimized for a traditional manufacturing process, right? And they'd say, hey, I'd like to prototype this. I'd like to test it out and you know, validate it prior to, to going to some other manufacturing process that's traditional, whatever it may be. And you would always say, well, this isn't designed for our process. It's not optimized. You know, it's not really a good fit for the way we make parts. And they, they would say, okay, that, that's fine, but I'm going to make it this other way at the end of the day, so I need to test it this way. And, and you'd find some middle ground there, right, and test the part out. Well, now when we have that conversation, we can say, sure, we can make this part for you, but why don't you optimize it for the manufacturing process you're going to use and why wouldn't you manufacture it with additive? So now you can optimize this part for the 
end manufacturing process you're going to use, but also prototype it on that same system. So now you have this optimized part that's going to probably have some benefits in your process, right? Higher efficiencies, lower cost, whatever it may be. You're going to prototype it with that design on that process. And then you can immediately flip the switch and begin manufacturing in production volumes using that same process, using that same design. So I think there's just a tremendous value to be gained from that. And I think we're only kind of on the, on the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of adoption and, and seeing the benefits of it. So I think that was a really long-winded answer to, to your question of, you know, identifying, I think, you know, binder jet systems, specifically the shop and production systems, and enabling manufacturers to, to grow from that entry-level rapid prototyping application through to true additive manufacturing. I, uh, I love that answer, Corey. I think what you touched on, prototyping in the same material and technology that you're going to use for mass production is really unheard of, right? Uh, especially when you think of the traditional 3D printing con uh, concepts where uh, you might have an SLA part or you might have an FDM part and it's eventually going to be injection molded. So it's not really a one-to-one -one prototyping test. Um, so I think from an, an engineered product development standpoint, having that same process and material uh, just really helps to predict how your parts are going to perform um, and also gives you more time to optimize your parts to your point about designing for the process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we're really, you know, just starting to get into truly designing for additive manufacturing, right? There's, there's a whole lot of optimization out there. There's a whole lot of really wild um, and cool looking parts, but I think in, in true adoption of those parts, we're really just kind of starting to get into it in terms of having them in the field being used and starting to make them, you know, in, in some serious volumes. So I think that's really exciting as well. I agree. Um, I, uh, I also really like the single pass jetting technology from desktop metal, which uh, if I was going to pick one to use for the rest of my life, I'd probably pick that one because it does have that prototype to production capability. Um, and I think it's probably one of the most fleshed out um, commercially viable metal printing options at volume. Um, but I got to tell you, another metal printing technology that I think is really cool is wire-fed, weld-based metal 3D printing. Um, powder handling is something that if I was going to like buy a printer to use, I'd be probably pretty, pretty concerned about. Um, not that it's not worth it in a, in a business industrial environment, but... Wire fed metal printing is something that I think is, is really cool. So you could just like strip the Romex out of your wall and feed it into your printer and it's, it'll just uh, work. <laughs> exactly, Kevin, just like that. <laughs> okay, good. I'm just making sure I'm setting the expectations for everybody. Yeah. It's, uh, it's more I like a MIG welder. Get, I was just going to say, I can't wait to get a video of someone trying that now. I heard on a podcast that you yeah. can uh, strip the wire out of your wall. I, uh, I, I unwound this coat hanger and tried to feed it through and don't know what happened. <laughs> I think uh, one of the drawbacks for wire-fed, weld-based metal printing is your parts get welded to the build tray, right? And that's another challenge that we see with DMLS or E-beam or other technologies that you don't see with um, the single-pass jetting or the bound metal deposition with, with some of desktop metals products. Um, when your parts are welded to the build tray, it just creates more headaches down the line where you have to cut things off and heat treat them, post machine them. Um, so while I'm excited about it, it doesn't seem as well established as some of the technologies that we're seeing start to be commercialized today. Still has a long way to go. Yes. I didn't think about that. You'd have to, like, what do you do? You just grind off the, the build tray every single time? Yeah, that's wow. exactly what you do. <laughs> I, I'd imagine you have to uh, carry a lot of build trays then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, is it, uh, I, I didn't think about that with the powder though. Is it dangerous to have powder and lasers? I mean, isn't powder combustible, uh, metal powder in a lot of instances? Corey, do you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I kind of live in it, right? I, I live in the, the metal powder. <laughs> no, listen, at, at the end of the day, right, any powder could potentially react, right? The flour sitting in your, your pantry could combust in, in the right environment, right? So anytime you're dealing with powder, it's certainly something you want to be aware and, and cautious of, specifically metal powders, right? Uh, metal powders are not exactly friendly. And so just like any other process where you're handling something of that nature, then there's certainly guidelines and precautions you want to be aware of and take. 
With that said, right, there's a lot of manufacturing workflows environments out there where safety precautions are required. And this is no different, right? It's just a, a slightly new and, and maybe not as familiar process. So there's some question marks that people aren't familiar with. But once you become informed, right, and you take the, the proper and correct workflows and safety guidelines into consideration, it, you know, it's no more dangerous than any other process out there. Uh, but to your point, it, it is a new conversation for a lot of people, right? A lot of people aren't working with metal powder today. Um, so it is somewhat of a new conversation to them. But there are lots of manufacturing processes out there like powder metallurgy and press and sensor and um, MIM-based processes that, that do it every day, right? And, and do it quite successfully. Um, so I think it's more of an education step um, that, that's being undertaken in that realm. So maybe that leads into, um, you know, part of the reason why we've asked you to be here today, Corey, is to talk a little bit about shop and, and give some context for the, for the people watching about, um, you know, how the shop system works and how that's different than, you know, the previous, um, you know, uh, metal rod MIM method that we have uh, in other desktop metal technology. Sure. Would it be beneficial maybe to, to walk through it a little bit, step by step? Sure. Yeah, yeah. why not? Sure. So if, if you look at kind of all of the, the metal systems that, that desktop metal is offering, they're all fundamentally based on MIM or, or metal injection molding, right? They're all leveraging that principle of taking a, a MIM-based powder and compounding it with binders. In the studio system, we're doing it beforehand to remove powder from the equation, right? Users aren't interacting with that loose powder. In the shop system, we're doing it actually on demand within the printer. So you're starting out with a bed of metal powder and you're jetting that binder onto that bed throughout the process. So yes, you're dealing with a metal powder now in its raw state, let's call it. But the benefit of that is, is the speed and throughput you're able to achieve as a result, right? So we're using uh, you know, inkjet styles of printing, uh, we call it binder jet. And as a result, right, you're covering the entire build volume in a single pass, kind of thus the name single pass jetting, right? So we're, we're covering that entire build volume in, in one pass versus when you look at an extrusion-based process, you're kind of drawing the part, you know, feature by feature and layer by layer. Here, we're making entire passes, printing multiple parts at once. So the throughput that we're achieving is much higher. And that's why we're able to start having these, you know, production conversations or, or higher volume conversations. Afterwards, right, we're, we're going to go through depowdering processes and sensoring processes to achieve our parts. Um, and we're going to recycle and reclaim as much of that powder as possible. So it, it's not reinventing the wheel here, right? We're, we're leveraging and using established processes and just transforming them um, into a new methodology for, for creating parts. So Corey, do you have maybe some like best use case examples? I'm trying to think of things where, you know, if I make part X or my part looks like this or has this um, size or characteristic to it, you know, that's really ideal for me to test out or for me to look to uh, address with a shop solution versus how I'm getting it made today. Are there, are there maybe certain industries that stand out or processes or um, part orientations that come to mind? Sure. Yeah. And that's a question that you get kind of on every process, right? Is how do you identify yeah. things that are best suited for it? And it, it goes back a little bit to, to kind of our, our earlier discussion. And it's that, you know, a lot of parts are designed for their manufacturing process today. And so there's not that many parts that are designed for manufacturing on binder jet systems or single pass jetting, right? So it's understanding, you know, what type of part could be designed or, or optimized for this type of process. And, you know, the, the correlation I kind of make, right, is when you design it for machining, for example, right? the more complex the, a part is, the more expensive it's going to be, right? The more operations and steps that have to be taken to achieve your part. Additive, it, it's kind of the opposite, right? Uh, you're building from the ground up. So the more complex it is usually, the less material there's going to be and, and the cheaper the end part is, right? So for kind of everyone out there that's scratching their head thinking about, you know, what parts could be suitable, it's really kind of your most complex, your most expensive parts are going to see the biggest impact from really any additive process, right? Our systems shop included, um, because of that kind of concept of, of building from the ground up and, and not paying for complexity. It's not to say that less complex parts aren't suitable, uh, but typically they're, they're blockier, there's less operations that are going to be done, and so they have a higher cost, really just driven by the, the material cost of the systems, right? It's when you really start to optimize and remove that material that you see huge benefits from additive. And so I'm only going to bring it up because you mentioned material. Um, in terms of material offerings and capabilities, what are the current um, you know capabilities that the shop system has? Or I know that you know materials are a big part of you know what the end result comes out to be. And desktop metal is working on a lot of different things. But um, can you shed some light on anything that's new to specific to shop or um, new in general in the desktop metal universe? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so shop is kind of just starting to be deployed to the field, right? We're starting to see uh, some names pop up there and systems being installed. If you guys are kind of browsing LinkedIn, so that's really exciting. Um, with that said, in terms of materials, right, 17.4 stainless steel is the first material that's available on the system. It also so happens to be the, the most commonly used material in the MIM industry. And we saw that same demand from, from our user base as well, right? So not only were we leveraging that MIM foundation once again, but most of the customers we were talking to had that as, as a priority material as well. So that's what's available today. But in theory, right, the MIM industry uses about 200 plus materials on a daily basis. And as we're leveraging them as our, our foundation, as our roots, we could in theory adopt most of those over to our process as well. So I think there's a lot of work at, at DM being done to understand, you know, where do, where's our demand, right? Who, what materials are most important for our process and would add the most value to our customers? And that's going to help define and prioritize, you know, the, the roadmap and path forward for future material availability. I saw something on, on LinkedIn, I think earlier this week, uh, with copper parts uh, that looked pretty cool coming off the machine. It looked shiny, at least. It looked, looked pretty neat. I mean, copper's pretty shiny as it is, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, we're really excited for that. Very cool. Corey, to, to chime in on materials, I want to ask you a question that I get asked probably in every conversation about desktop metal is, uh, when are you launching aluminum? Yeah, <laughs> I think I get that conversation or that question in almost every conversation I have, right? So the, the materials you listed are great. What about aluminum, right? Um, everyone wants so aluminum, aluminum, nothing else. <laughs> right? So it, it always kind of turns into a bigger discussion when that comes up, right? So aluminum, it, it's certainly on our roadmap. Um, I, I kind of communicate it as a longer term material due to its reactive nature and some of the challenges associated with the, the sintering of aluminum. Um, but where I usually kind of, what I'd like to touch on in, in the aluminum discussion, right, is why do you use aluminum today, right? Is it because it's cheap? Is it because it's easy to machine? Or is it just because that's how you've always done it and, you know, that's how you want to do it in the future? So it, it, the first two points are pretty easy to address, I would say, right? In terms of the, the cheap nature of it, right? Well, in terms of additive, if we can remove material, if we can lightweight the, the, the component and optimize it, potentially we can drive down the cost in that manner rather than just using a, a cheaper material to start. And then the second point in terms of being easy to machine, well, additive is, is a near net shape process, right? We're printing these geometries that are you know, very close, if not exactly, as they're designed to be. So if we're accomplishing that, you know, supposedly we're, you know, conceptually, we're reducing the amount of machining that would need to be required or, or done to your parts after printing. So in that effect, you know, if we're reducing the machining time by printing this near net shape geometry, are we effectively not accomplishing the same thing or, or even more so in terms of reducing machining time by requiring less? Um, and then the third point, you know, just because it, it's the way they've always done it, I get that a lot, which is, you know, always interesting to kind of touch on is, you know, why wouldn't you try to leverage and utilize, you know, different processes and, and potentially manufacturing workflows that can produce a, a more effective part for your, for your workflow? Um, so it's always kind of an interesting discussion and, and talking point to have is to really understand why someone's using aluminum today and if there's other workflows that might be better suited for their needs. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about aluminum being cheap, easy to machine, like those two criteria alone. Okay, that's got to constitute a majority of the demand for that. So if you can accomplish, if you work backwards from what do I need this to look like and what characteristics do I need it to have? And then how do I get there? What's the most efficient way to get there? It may very well not be an aluminum product. It might be something totally different. So interesting. Uh, perspective. That, that, you just hit the nail on the head, right? <laughs> what are you trying to accomplish yeah. and what adds the most value to you? It's kind of the, always the first question to ask, right? It, it, it should be less so. This is how we do it today. So this is what we need. It's, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? And does this process potentially, you know, have, have some value to add there or can it do a better job of solving that problem? Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's so frustrating to sometimes to have that conversation with people where like um, both on the plastic and on the metal side, uh, someone will say, oh, I need, I need peak. I'm like, okay, well, why do you need peak? And they'll be like, well, it, we make it out of peak today. I want this part printed in, in peak. And we'll be like, well, what about PEC? What about Ultem? What about carbon fiber nylon? Um, and it's, it's seems to be a significant mental hurdle to, to break things down into, uh, we always say the application drives the material, drives the machine that we would recommend to someone. So we try to start with what is the part and what do you want to accomplish with it? Um, so it's a, I guess it's nice to hear that uh, I'm not the only one who has these conversations on a regular basis. Yeah, you're not alone out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kevin, I'm sure you have some, a couple more questions, uh, but Corey, you've talked about um, that, that education and designing for the process quite a bit. 
how do you how do you get over that hurdle with people who are interested in in desktop metal and how do you guess, help educate them on designing for your process instead of three axis cnc yeah you know it, it's a great question and i guess the best way to describe you know how you work through is is it's a partnership right you know everyone that's using additive everyone in the industry it's you know it's one big initiative that we're all trying to achieve right and so what we do at, at dm right and, and that's what i can kind of speak to is, is we always have a partnership with our users and, and people investigating the equipment to walk them through the best practices of our systems and how to best leverage them right so we have a you know a, an applications team and we got some stellar people on it and they're really good at you know optimizing and communicating how to best leverage this technology and how, how to optimize your parts for that process, right? And the answer isn't always, you know, this is a perfect fit. Sometimes it's, you know, your current process is probably better suited. And then other times it's, you know, this is how we can make this part a home run via an additive process. So I think it's just being in partner with the people using your equipment and communicating back and forth and having an ongoing dialogue to make sure that, you know, we're, we're solving a problem and, you know, we're optimizing for the process. Gotcha. Um... And then one other thing that I've been, I guess, meeting to, to get your insight on, uh, I feel like we have a lot of conversations with people on metal versus plastic, right? When should someone need metal versus needing like a high strength plastic? Do you have any opinions on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the way I kind of always spin it, right, is you use metal when you have to use metal, right? Typically there's some requirement or some threshold where you probably already tried plastic and it just hasn't cut it and you need to go to that next step, right? Generally speaking, plastic's cheaper and easier to produce. So if plastic, you know, is suitable for the application, it's probably going to be used. So you only use metal when you have to. Um, and there's typically some requirement that's going to dictate that, right? Whether it's the environment it's in, in terms of chemical or, or temperature or the forces being applied to the part, you're gonna have a pretty clear indication that, you know, this is, this is a part that has to be made out of metal and, and here are the reasons why, right? And as soon as we understand that, we can start to design and optimize the components to best suit that, that problem or, or, or that application. Gotcha. I, I, thought, I thought you'd have an, a unique insight because um, of the fiber system, which I'm not sure how involved you are actually with or not, um, but it's, uh, I think, a really unique value uh, for a subscription-based industrial printer uh, that's really pushing the boundaries of, uh, of composite printing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been blown away by the reception we've gotten at the the fiber system. It's, it, I think it really has an awesome spot, spot in kind of the, the market and the, the potential applications that it, it's suitable for are, are pretty exciting, right? But I think you, you're right in the point you're bringing up there, right? Is we, we certainly are seeing polymers and, and filled materials start to fill some of those roles, right? And, and be suitable for applications and, and use cases that maybe were historically made out of metal, right? But uh, I think that's going to be something super interesting to keep your eyes on as it kind of progresses and, and see where it's being implemented, right? And I think you're going to see some trends where it's, it's replacing other polymers out there or potentially replacing metal components as well. Uh, so that, that's going to be pretty exciting. Definitely. Um, Kevin, Ben, I know I, uh, I deviated a little bit from the, the question list that, uh, no, that's good. We, had, we had discussed. Did I, did I miss anything? Are there other questions? You know, the only other question that I wanted to throw out there is, um, and obviously not to get a, uh, a perspective on the company's future outlook, but where do you see metal printing in five years? You know, is this, is that the kind of timeline that we're looking at to see like real adoption or is it at that 10, 15 years out? Is it 30 years out and we're really at the cusp? Cause you know, depending on, you know, the perspective that you have, it might look like it's something that's in wide use today. And it, this is a different technology. That's, you know, just a new player in the mix. Um, where do you see like metal printing in general and the, the role it's going to have in, in additive in general in the next like five to five to 10 years even? Yeah, so so I can't speak to it too much, right? Because I, I don't think I'm allowed to make uh, <laughs> claims for the company, right? But uh, on a really general term and a high level, um, you know, just look at the industry and where it's come already. You know, the, the additive industry is just moving at breakneck speeds and, and it's evolving and transforming every day. So I, I see no reason not to believe that that's going to continue to happen, right? And we're going to continue to adopt and transform and expand within the additive segment. So I think we're only, I think I said it earlier, right? I think we're only on the tip of the iceberg and it's just going to continue to, to grow and, and be a really amazing space to be in as we move forward. I didn't mean to cut you off, Ben. I didn't know if you had another question there. You know, it's pretty funny that you asked that question. 
Um, I was actually going to use the five-year one also, but what industry do you think will be taken over by additive in five years? So almost the same question, slightly different, but I think we're on the same wavelength. I don't know about an industry specifically, but a segment, I, I guess I, I could expect, right? So where you see additive being adopted already is that kind of bridged production, right? I think that's where the first step is going to be taken in terms of true additive manufacturing. And what I mean by that, right, when you look at a lot of traditional manufacturing processes, they have a pretty hard cutoff on volume of parts, right? If you're under this number or volume, you're probably going to get a lot of no bids or people not responding or the price per part to manufacture is just going to be astronomical, right? And so the benefit of additive is, is that doesn't really start to factor in. So you can start to manufacture in lower volumes. You can start to have that true uh, kind of manufacturing cost per part and be competitive, but not have that minimum um, order requirement. So I, what I mean by that is, right, you can start to do bridge manufacturing or pri pilot manufacturing um, and start to achieve those lower volumes cost effectively. And at the same time, you have the freedom to still continue to design and iterate and transform your parts without needing to, to cut new molding or, or tooling um, and have the, all the added expense. So I think what you're going to start to see is, is lower volume manufacturing be more competitive. And you're also going to see faster design iterations. Uh, become available during manufacturing and through manufacturing. So you're going to see more iterations and, and faster product development on parts. So more, I think that's uh, where the, the first step is going to be. More personalization and mass customization. And that's certainly a, a big trend is that everybody gets a one-off everything that's exactly what I want this one time and I don't have to order 10,000 of them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That. But not only that, just more development on products, right? Like a lot of products right. are confined because they don't want to pay, you know, companies don't want to pay tooling costs, right? Once you have right. the design of a product, that's it. It's locked for some period of time because you don't want to have to cut a new mold that could cost, you know, astronomical amounts of money. So I think you're going to see more iterations of parts, even large volumes of parts that aren't customized for individual users, but just more iterations and, and product development going on because you don't have those costs associated with it. Those cycle times go down and then consumers end up benefiting from it. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. I would love an entire car with a lattice structure. So if you could start thinking on how to do that for me, that'd be great. Uh, low, I have a low budget though. I don't know if uh, it would be possible, but that'd be really cool. Yeah, I, I think, think that's going to be the first step for additive, right? <laughs> the, the next big thing. You might want to talk to Ferrari or Koenigsegg or <laughs> some of the bigger players in the hypercar space there. I think I just saw it. It's either a motor motorcycle or a four wheeler who did have a lattice structure on their, uh, on their car. It was a one-off. It was out of metal too. So cool. I, I'm looking forward to that being more of the norm. I really am. Cybertruck, but lattice. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to like clean it or something, right? Imagine yeah, that right. Dash the lattice, uh, dashboard. <laughs> yeah, that might be a bit of a pain. Scratch Don't ruin bugs. my dreams. <laughs> awesome. Um, I, think, uh, I think that about wraps everything up, Corey. Uh, we're going to do one, uh, one more quick segment um, since we always like to have a more tech focused uh portion of the the podcast but again thank you so much for for joining us today uh and sharing your your industry knowledge with us uh you're you're welcome to, to hop off at this point we'll uh, we'll keep on rolling yeah thanks for joining us thank, thank you Corey. really thank appreciate you, the time Good to talk to you. we'll talk to you soon Bye. yeah and then there were three <laughs> look at this <laughs> i'll tell you what one thing that Corey was talking about that i really like um, is that bringing down the cost for low volume uh, production of parts. Um, and I don't think that just applies to metal, but it applies to plastic also. Um, I'm excited to see how it impacts hardware technology startups, where if, you're, if you are starting up a new Tesla, or if you're starting up, a, call it like an electric bike company, or uh, even just like a consumer product for wearables, for electronics. Uh, yeah, any of that stuff. Yeah, um, and you need to to test a thousand devices. It's we will reach a point where it's not going to make sense for you to go buy an injection mold. It's going to make more sense for you to buy a three D printer, do it yourself, be able to do those rapid design iterations, be able to do that low volume production, um, and not rely on a, just a super expensive upfront cost. Uh, I think it lowers the barrier to entry for, for new companies to get their and, ideas out there. 
I think you'll start to see too legacy companies, these larger, you know, conglomerates, the Kimberly Clarks and Georgia Pacifics and whatever else of the world that have these massive portfolios of products that they make where they can incorporate an additive strategy and, you know, 10x the cycle time of that production development and go through those iterations faster and create better products and streamline that process and you'll start to see those pair off and those succeed and those that adopt that technology are going to get that added benefit and then i'm excited as a consumer because again that makes everything less expensive and that makes you know more customization and all that stuff easier so i think uh that was really something that we don't really necessarily consider too much when i think about like additive manufacturing and its adoption like down the road what the real life implications like that are if there's a you know, an e-bike that I want to get, you know, wait a couple of years and it might be a whole lot cheaper or wait a couple of months and it might be a whole lot cheaper because they're incorporating these technologies to, to make their products better. So and I pretty think cool the, stuff. I think the coolest part or the thing that makes the most sense to me is the higher amount of production that you can do compared to all the other systems that I've seen so far. Um, I was a desktop metal that had, uh, I don't know if they ever even made it. It was a build tray that was a circle that just kept going. Was it Stratasys? Stratasys, and yeah. Was it Stratasys? That's our, that's our J55, Ben. <laughs> the, the plate spins and it deposits material as it spins. Um, it's, it's really cool to watch. Next time it is, you're in the office. I haven't seen it yet. I haven't, uh, back haven't been office. in. I was going to say, yeah, I haven't been in the office to see the new printer. Yeah, but what I like about this is you can build so many parts at the same time. And then I didn't know this until I saw the, the powder is the support material itself. So you can just build the entire cube, your whole build tray. It's not flat anymore. It's, uh, it's cubic space that you're using. And it looks way faster. It's like the fastest thing I've seen so far. That's, a, that's the beauty of binder jetting compared yeah. to, um, and I guess selective laser centering also, um, is, is that mm -hmm. nesting capability that we just don't really get on FDM and you don't really get on DMLS because it has to do with that attachment to the build tray. Um, and there's a less of an explosion factor than with the laser. <laughs> yeah, and not, uh, when talking not to be overlooked. <laughs> when yeah. talking about aluminum, like first off, I think one reason why people like aluminum is it's really lightweight. Uh, but it does tend to explode. I mean, what is tannerite besides for powdered aluminum and one other ingredient? And that's a that's just a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so I do like that uh, there's no really really hot laser shining into powdered metal. Uh, it seems a little safer for an office, not going to lie. Definitely. And yeah. on top of that, like lasers aren't cheap, right? Yeah. So that's a good point. You've, you've got these, these many kilowatts of laser power um, being used and you've got precision optics. And so that just balloons the cost you've got, of a you've metal got printing system. To power a laser. Yeah. Um, that's not cheap. You've got to have fuel for it. You've got to have an operator trained to run a laser. You've got to have extra PPE and safety precautions for um, radiation and whatever else might get exposed. And yeah, it, it definitely takes that from I can, you know, put this in the back office to we need to have a dedicated space for this and it changes that calculus quite a bit. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, but to kind of kind of wrap things up, I didn't want this whole episode to just be uh, kind of talking about the future and stuff. So I wanted to, uh, instead of doing a 3D printing tip for 3D printing application, I thought it might be fun to highlight a 3D printing technology that is generally... Um, I think overlooked or maybe not very well known, and that is sheet lamination. So it's not very popular. Um, but so it's back to school. You're talking where you run the piece of paper through the laminator, and that's how you make yes. the dittos. Hey. Right? That's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling it's something a little different. It is a little different. So um, most all 3D printing processes work layer by layer. Um, and this one, your layer is a sheet of material. So there's a company called MCOR that makes paper 3D printers. So put down a sheet of paper, go around that, that outline with like an X-Acto knife, glue stick, more paper. Go around with the knife again and repeat this process. It's a little more sophisticated than that. Um, <laughs> but you repeat this process until you get paper 3d models and you just kind of rip off the excess paper on the outside it's actually one of the first 3d printing technologies beyond fdm or sla um, and people liked it because you could get 
forms from the digital to the physical super cheap because it's office paper. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to tie into, into this episode's conversation because even though it hasn't been super popular, this has been done with things like high strength composites, carbon fiber meshes, fiberglass meshes, Kevlar meshes, and it's also been done with different sheet metals, right? So a piece of sheet metal, laser or plasma cutter goes around the outside profile of that layer. Another piece of sheet metal, continue to cut, weld them together. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to have a conversation of maybe where it might fit, where it doesn't fit, why it's popular or not popular. Um, what do you guys think compared to uh, some of the, the printing technologies that we've talked about on the podcast? Yeah, I've seen uh, a lot of it in architecture and furniture. So okay. um, I didn't know that's what it was called, but even in when I did sculpture, uh, that was one of the processes that we had to learn. There's some really cool chairs and cool tables that uh, use plywood um, and just sheet after sheet or layer after layer of plywood. And it looks really cool. Uh, it takes a whole lot of work. Um, but yeah, I think it looks really good. My old office, uh, our staircase was, uh, it had that really? process. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Yeah, it uh, looked great. I liked looking at it every day. It was great for videos too. It's pretty fancy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, I, uh, I like the, I guess the advantage of like the cheap stock material being paper or wood or, you know, you're not relying on metal powders or plastic filaments in that regard. Um, but I think the, the big downside is probably some of the, the cleanup that you have to do, right. And cutting away the extra sheets at the end of the process. Um, not to mention like welding it together, right? If you're talking about the metal application, <laughs> like welding it together isn't a step you've got to, you can overlook. Like that's labor intensive. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that if you're, if you're worried about it, and again, to our conversation earlier, if you're worried about getting backwards from this end shape, if it's paper, you know, can't cheap ABS do the same thing? You know what I mean? Like how, what, what could the cost difference really be between office paper these days and, uh, you know, cheap ABS or ASA or something like that? I think that's a good point. I think that's probably a, a big reason why the paper rapid prototyping, um, maybe someone from a paper 3D printing company is watching this and getting very upset, but it <laughs> hasn't really caught on or has kind of died out over time because that plastic filament feedstock has just come down in price over time. Right. And carbon fiber, I can imagine, might lend itself a little bit more to that process because isn't that done sort of in sheets to begin with? Yeah, typically it starts as a, a fabric, right? right. Um, and then you would typically use like a layup form, which is another good application for 3D printing is to make carbon fiber layup tooling and that sort of thing. But if you don't have that, um, you can put down a layer and then jet um, a resin over it, put down a layer, cut around the outside. Um, there's a couple startup companies, I think, doing that to make really strong, unique carbon fiber shapes. Um, completely different from like the desktop metal fiber system um, or Mark Forged or you know, any of those other composite 3D printing companies. Um, I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Um, I had uh, an internet maybe, uh, glitch out here for a second. Being a Kevin, you're on mute. I had a, I had an internet shortage for a second. My dog also barked, so I put myself on mute. Uh, gotcha. to be safe. Gotcha. You know, sheet lamination being as obscure as it is, I don't know if it was a great starting point for a, a technology highlight. Segment. Well, you know what? You know, so I mean, it's a technology that looks like it's getting surpassed, but I'm sure there are probably applications for it. And you got to know your roots. I mean, if this stuff was done in paper at one point. I think the aesthetics, yeah, the evolution. Uh, I think obviously it, it's beat by the newer technologies. I don't think it's as fast. It probably isn't, potentially isn't as accurate. Um, a lot of different aspects, but it does look cool. Um, and when you're, and I, I think paper is kind of out unless you have like really thick cardstock, whatever it is, maybe you have one model and you want it to look unique. But with the, with the plywood application, you can't print plywood. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Plywood is so cheap. It's so heavy. And there's just, you need a lot of heat and pressure and glue, <laughs> which <laughs> that just doesn't work. But it does give you cool architectural, architectural structures. 
and you can't really get that with 3D printing yet. That's true. Some of our, our material capabilities, as, as much as they've grown over the course of time, often pretty just limited to, to different versions of plastic. Yeah, and uh, there are some wood materials now. They look cool. I think they look kind of like the paper ones you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, cool, cool uh, application. What are they really being used for still? Is there anything you, you know of? I think, uh, I think it's a, a strange take on full color printing, actually, because you're, you just have an inkjet head onto paper again. You can put ink on the edge of where you're going to cut afterwards. So I think it's, it's partially used for um, hmm. some full color applications, probably in, in architecture and the like, when you have rather large models of buildings and concepts. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, that sounds so tedious. Has come has come so far, right. um, <laughs> and that cost has gone down significantly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So. I think I did it with uh, with plexiglass. That was okay. kind of a cool project, um, and that'd be that that would be a cool idea is printing like a opaque image on each piece of the glass. That'd be cool, but again, it's art. It's not yeah, really. Yeah, that sounds like an art installation. Yeah, not a not a functional okay. prototype. Yeah, yeah, no, it wouldn't be. Well, it could be, I guess, but it, it's supposed to look cool. It'd be. So yeah, I don't know. Is it a dead? Is it a uh, is it a dead technology? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, you know, I thought it would be fun to talk about, and as someone who loves technology, I do think yeah. it's fun to talk about. I think you know it's what? a neat process. What about I'm not this? sure it has much of a future. <laughs> if you uh, if you utilize sheet lamination in your process today, leave us a comment and tell us what you're using it for and how how the application yeah. benefits your business and why you maybe why you haven't considered uh, plastic as a replacement. And yeah. maybe we'll get some discussion over it. Tell me why your technology isn't dead or dying. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that there's got to be an application somewhere where somebody says, no, this is exactly why we use it for this, and this is why it has a benefit, and it's cost savings and all those other things. So it's Please, the Internet. Tell us what you think, guys. If you're, if you're out there, help us understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think as a, as a concept, it's super cool. Um, but <laughs> definitely we're, uh, we're more experts on the, on the plastic and metal side yeah. of things compared to the, the more... Uh, Less, uh, less popular material mm -hmm. processes in, uh, in technology. But we talk about additive manufacturing and 3D printing, and we need to be inclusive of all technologies, right? Of course. Not really. <laughs> I mean, as long as it has to do with additive. <laughs> yeah, that's true. As long as it's still um, relevant in the year 2020. Yeah, are we going to be eating our words like 10 years from now? Laminate printing is like the <laughs> biggest technology in some field. They're going to play this podcast and laugh at us. <laughs> you know, if that's the case, I will happily admit that I was wrong. I was going to say, that um, sounds like a, a plate full of crow I wouldn't mind eating. That'd be okay. Yes. Um, it's an interesting so, phrase. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if I use that right. I don't know if that's like the right context no, in which to use that expression. That <laughs> like, you, you, you're going to eat crow like you're... I'm an old person. I don't know what to tell you guys. <laughs> that 70s show has that, that there you go. eating scene. It's, if it's okay. something Red Foreman probably said, then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... If you're out there and are an expert or a pioneer yeah. in sheet lamination, feel free to get in contact with us. Uh, maybe we'll even bring you on the show as a guest. Why not? We can, we can make that happen. Um, but make sure to, to leave some comments uh, below letting us know uh, what you thought about uh, bringing on guests and our conversation around uh, metal printing and the future of 3D printing. Um, I'm going to say it publicly so that we can be held accountable for next episode. We will have a comment response segment in our next podcast episode. Um, so leave a comment below and maybe you will get featured uh, in our next podcast. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, um, share it with friends, share it with your enemies. Really doesn't matter. Um, someone that you think might, uh, might like hearing about 3D printing. Um, thanks again for watching and have a good day. Have a good day. Bye.